Okay. Welcome to Law and Justice. I'm Jane Mulcahy. This is a special series on the topic of how to talk policy and influence people. And today I am so delighted to be joined by Dr. Ian McGilchrist. Hi, Ian, how are you? Hello, uh, I'm very well, thank you. And thank you for inviting me along. Um, so before we get into your fascinating uh, work on the brain, Ian, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and your professional background, please? Um, yes, I've got a checkered career. Um, I intended to read philosophy and theology, which have always been my interest okay. at Oxford. But in 1972, when I went up, it wasn't um, an honours degree. And they said, you must do an honours degree. Uh, why don't you do English, which was a subject you had to take a school exam subject to get in. Uh -huh. And I just chose English. They said, well, obviously, you like that and seem to do it well. So why don't you come and do that? Um, so I did. And then after I'd qualified, I got a fellowship that enabled me to research and do what I liked for seven years uh, at All Souls College. And, um, and I went back to my earlier interest in philosophy and theology. And what happened there was that I was reflecting on what was wrong with the way in which in academic departments we deal with works of art, works of literature. Mm -hmm. And my conclusion was that somebody in the past really take pains to create something that's quite unique, can't really be paraphrased. It's not just in the obvious meaning, it's all the rest that's going on. Um, they also, uh, its meaning has to be implicit. It's rather like if you unpack it all explicitly, it's no longer moving you in any way or having any of its effects. It's rather like unpacking and explaining a joke. It just kills it. <laughs> yeah. um, and the, the other thing was that um, it seemed to me that we were constantly taking things out of context, both taking, um, say, a poem out of its historical and personal context, but also taking phrases and ideas out of the poem, out of the context mm -hmm. in which they lived. And so these three issues, which were to do with um, uniqueness, embodiment, um, uh, implicitness, in other words, and contextualization seemed to me very important and centered on the mind-body problem. And to okay. cut a long story short, I, I went back to the, his, the uh, philosophy seminars on the mind-body problem and found that the approach was simply too disembodied and that I really needed to do this in a much more embodied way, which effectively meant studying medicine okay. and coming to know more about what happens when something goes wrong with somebody's brain and it changes their personality and their mind, or something goes wrong in their, uh, in their mind and it changes their, their body, they become ill physically. So it was, it was at that interface that I was interested. So I basically took myself off um, as a late starter. I was 10 years older than all the bright young things that were going okay. into medicine straight from school um, and at, at 28 and they were saying, so brave of you, you know, like oh, hilarious. in the grave. <laughs> yeah. um, and actually, of course, it's been a great advantage because it's meant that I can contextualize what I've learned about people, their bodies, their illnesses in the framework of the humanities, philosophy, mm -hmm. art, literature. So um, that got me to work in the area of neuropsychiatry, neuropsychology, the overlap between mind and body. And that's uh, in, it was in, in that that I then started to see the importance of the issue of the differences between the two hemispheres. Okay. So this is the, the great book, the, uh, the Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World um, that you wrote. And it took you some time, I think, to, uh, to, to, to do it. It was a lengthy process. And I'm not surprised because of the, the wide terrain and all the studies that you cover there. But Ian, what is your central thesis? And I suppose, why did you decide to write the book in the first instance? Well, a number of things, I suppose, came together, things that I puzzled about philosophically all my life and therefore wanted to write about if I could. And some things that struck me as very interesting in what I was learning about the brain. I was discouraged by kind, loyal friends 
uh, uh, not to go down the path of looking at hemisphere differences because um, it, it had become, by the time we're talking about the late 80s, early 90s, it had become more or less completely dismissed by mainstream science. They said it was it's all, all pop psychology and it's all been exploded. But um, it, that didn't seem to me at all a satisfactory response. Um, for one thing, why is the brain divided? A question that had never been addressed in medical school. We just assumed it was. It's rather <laughs> odd that since it exists only to make connections, it should have a whopping great divide down the middle. Yeah. Then why is it, as why is it asymmetrical? You know, the, the skull is, why should the brain have to be asymmetrical with expansions in the left posterior cortex and the right anterior cortex? And then thirdly, why would the band of fibers at the base of the brain, the corpus callosum, which connects, in fact, only directly 2% of all neurons in the brain, um, why is its effect very often inhibitory to say, you know, from one hemisphere to the other, by the way, I'm dealing with this, keep out of it. Yeah. That got me interested in what was going on here, because I discovered um, that, in fact, all animals that we know of, uh, and indeed all birds, reptiles, amphibians, down to even nematode worms, insects, extremely ancient creatures and very simple creatures, have asymmetrical neuronal systems. In fact, the oldest creature we know of is 700 million years old. I mean, its origins are, mm -hmm. and you can still find specimens in, in the seas off these coasts. Um, and it already has an asymmetrical neuronal system. And I thought that was very interesting. Sure. I was also learning on the wards from the fascinating, privileging business of being able to get to know people who, through some act of nature had lost use of one part of uh, their brain. And then it mattered very much which had produced entirely different results. So the idea that there was nothing in this difference uh, was clearly a mistake. And I uh, determined to find out more about it. In a nutshell, what I, I found was that We'd been talking all the time about what do the hemispheres do as though the brain was a machine. And the question you ask of a machine is, what's it for? What does it do? Mm -hmm. And in the original vision of people in the 60s and 70s, I say original because I'm talking about after the very first split brain operations were carried out in California at Caltech. These were operations to help people with intractable epilepsy regain some kind of um, valuable life. Um, it, it stopped an epileptic discharge um, going across the whole brain and losing okay. consciousness. So it was a radical improvement for such people. But it also enabled us to interrogate each hemisphere on its own. And what we found, at least at that stage, what we thought we'd found, was that the left hemisphere dealt with language and with reason and the right hemisphere with pictures and emotion. Mm. And it turned out over the subsequent couple of decades that um, each one of these propositions was wrong and that both hemispheres are involved in everything that we do. So where does that leave um, my interest in the differences? Yes. I'm perfectly intact because my, my interest is in the way in which they contribute to each of these, the way in which they approach them, and the purposes, if you like, that are fulfilled by each hemisphere's take on each of these aspects of mm -hmm. life. So everything in our world is dealt with by both hemispheres, but each has a reliably different take. Now, how this gels with my earlier interests is that, and why I say philosophical interest drove me to want to write the book, is that I had been puzzling very much about this problem with literature. And in fact, I wrote a book in my 20s called Against Criticism, which was published by Faber and then sort of unceremoniously pulped, I think, after <laughs> um, selling 400 copies. Uh, but, um, but it's now actually um, a rather sought out after item. So if you've got I a copy, imagine. you can retire on it. Yeah. So, but um, I found it very difficult to articulate why leaving something implicit and uncertain was actually more valuable than trying to pin it down and make it explicit. Right. Why the uniqueness of something mattered more than the category to which it belonged. And why 
thinking wasn't just something abstract, but was always involved with the context, meaning your emotions, your body, your environment, your society, the world all around you. And I, I had the luck to hear a lecture one day, which explained by a, a man called Dr. John Cutting, who had spent years looking at sitting at the bedsides of people who'd had um, injuries or, or tumors or strokes in the right hemisphere and discovered that this completely changed their world mm. in a way that having a left hemisphere stroke doesn't. A left hemisphere stroke changes your world in one way because you can't use your right hand and for most people it impairs speech, pretty big deal. Mm. But with the right hemisphere, you know, the left hand people can say, well, I can get by without that unless they're left handed. Um, and, you know, the speech thing is um, not affected. So um, he had actually looked at it. And what happens is that when the right hemisphere is, as it were, not functioning, all kinds of important aspects of reality disappear. Everything becomes schematic, two-dimensional, linear, fragmented, um, disembodied, okay. decontextualized, um, rather in a way that, I mean, one way of putting it is it's, it's a bureaucrat's dream okay. in which all the individuality, all the context, all the nuance is taken out and people are just in categories which can right. be manipulated. Whereas in the right hemisphere, uh, the world is not made up of separate things, but is ultimately seamless. I mean, although obviously you can distinguish between elements of experience, of course, but they, they're not fundamentally separate and don't have to therefore be inventively put together by you to build up a world because they already are there as part of the world. They're also not um, fixed and unchanging, but are constantly moving and evolving and flowing. Um, and an image that I like and often recur to is that of a river, which um, as Heraclitus uh, understood, um, changes by remaining the same and mm -hmm. it remains the same by changing. So yeah. the, the river, the river passes my house. Uh, I imagine it's very much where I left it this morning, but <laughs> it, it's the completely new river because different water is in it. And right. if you photographed it, you'd find there were different patterns in it and so forth. So uh, this is a different vision of the world. It's one in which the unique has a place in which all the implicit stuff like body language, facial gestures, intonation of the voice are important to meaning as well as just the dictionary mm. um, meanings that you would get a computer would have. Um, and it's altogether a much more animate world than that of the left hemisphere, which is effectively a mechanistic, robotic kind of world. There's a lot more to say about that, but that's perhaps enough to get us started. Well, it is a massive book, so yeah. Um, but when you, you covered some of the, the differences there nicely in terms of um, function between the hemispheres, um, but they also differ in terms of attention uh, you write, and, and the way they see and interpret the world in, in, in general. Can you give a few more examples of, of, um, of that, please, Ian, um, in terms of the differences and what it means, I suppose, to us and for us? Well, it, it does mean a lot. And I must admit that it only dawned on me bit by bit quite how fundamental the difference in attention is. Because I'd been encouraged by cognitive neuroscience to think of attention as another function of the brain, like memory or something. Mm. Um, mind you, we have little idea what memory actually is either, yeah. but, <laughs> but attention um, is foundational. Um, we the way we attend to the world actually makes the world we experience. And that's the only world we can know. So that with certain attention, um, it will seem uh, like one thing with a different kind of attention will seem like another. And uh, uh, an example I sometimes give is of the house uh, having a mountain behind it. And uh, the name of the of the, the mountain is a, a Norse word, meaning the sloping rock, because it has this sloping outline. And to, what that tells you is that to, uh, 
um, the Norsemen who were sailing a, a long way from home in dangerous seas, that this was a sign of a landmark to steer away from the coast, which has a lot of rocks. Mm -hmm. So it had meaning for them because they were attending it, to it in a certain way. But then the, um, the, the, the Picts who also settled under it saw it as the home of the gods. In the 18th century, people came here and drew it because of its beautiful colors and forms. And uh, in the 19th century, people got very interested in its geology because it's okay. an, an exceptionally good example of columnar basalt. Um, you know, so to the, each of these different uh, p modes of attention, the mountain was something different. And to a physicist, um, it's 99.99% empty space. And the other bit, we don't know what it is. So, you know, which of these is the real mountain? And what I want to stress is there isn't such a thing as the real mountain. It's no good just saying, well, it's really a lump of rock because that is also a very particular point of view. Mm. Uh, why would you privilege that particular point of view, which leaves so much that I've mentioned out? Yeah. So when we're looking at something, we can always only see it in a certain way, like those um, uh, visual illusions where you see either two faces or you see a vase, you know, you can't see them all at the same time. Um, so attention is foundational and the difference between them is based, I think, on this is, I must say, this is my theory, but I don't know a better one. And nobody has wanted to, to take arms against it, is that there is an evolutionary purpose. Um, animals all have to understand two things or to be able to do two things with their attention at the same time. One is to focus on something very small, like a, a seed, so that as a bird, you can pick it up accurately and quickly. Um, and the other is to have a broad, open uh, vision of the world in which you can see predators, you can see your mates, you see the whole picture. And that's impossible to do uh, at the same time with one um, attentional focus. So in fact, we have two, one in each hemisphere. Mm -hmm. And the left hemisphere focuses sharply on a tiny, tiny part of reality, no more than perhaps three degrees out of the 360 degrees possible attentional arc. And the other hemisphere, the right hemisphere, has a much broader, open, sustained attention, which makes sense of the world. Okay. Uh, whereas, at, at, obviously, if you have a very narrow beam attention, you flit from one place to another, you see this bit, you see that bit, and now you've got to put all that together. So one of them underlies the very fact that the world seems a whole and the other underlies the fact that the world seems broken up into into bits and has no life together if you like uh, this is important and other there are other differences in attention for example the the left hemisphere gets more stuck on things the right hemisphere is better able to free up attention mm -hmm. it's better able to notice things it's less likely to jump to conclusions than the left hemisphere, which is very quick and dirty. <laughs> um, Brahmachandran calls the right hemisphere the devil's advocate because it's always saying, right. yes, but it might be something else. So it's been uh -huh. more careful. It's more reliable. So the old uh, cliche that the left hemisphere might be a bit boring, like, you know, an accountant, but it was at least down to, to earth and reliable. <laughs> yeah. um, whereas the right hemisphere was a bit sort of flibberty gibbet. This is not right. The right hemisphere... Has, um, is more reliable in terms of reality testing, is um, more, has more of a moral compass than the left hemisphere, understands our moral obligations better than the left hemisphere, um, and is generally um, much better able to understand everything human. So uh, what is not said as well as what is said, um, facial expressions, bodily gestures, uh, all of those things, and understanding just an image in context mm. to understand what's going on. If you give people a picture, what's going on in this picture? Yeah. Uh, if they have right hemisphere damage, they can't tell you. If they have left hemisphere damage, they're able to explain what went on before, what goes after this picture. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But those are the sort of main differences in terms of attention. Yeah. And, um, Am I right that the, the right hemisphere is better able to comprehend narrative as well, whereas the left hemisphere has, has a predisposition to um, think it's right, even when it might not be, um, and, and more of a propensity for denial 
Yes, and um, you're quite right. Narrative is best appreciated by the right hemisphere. If an isolated left hemisphere, in for example, a split brain patient, um, is given a narrative and asked to retell it, instead of telling it in the order of the episodes that makes human sense, it will group together into a category the episodes that seem to have a feature in common. The left hemisphere likes to break everything down into pigeonholes and go, oh, I see it's one of those. It goes uh -huh. in there. Whereas the right hemisphere is always going, it's rather complex. And this is actually probably unique and it needs to be thought of in the round. When it comes to denial, this is a fascinating area. I mentioned there are differences in attention and that the left hemisphere tends only to a part. Well, more than that, it attends only to the right half of the world, the bit where the right hand, which does its bidding, goes around manipulating things, because right. the left hemisphere is the one that helps us manipulate the world to, to build a nest, to get food, to catch prey, so on. But it doesn't really have a good understanding, as I've explained, of the whole, whereas the right hemisphere helps us understand. So after a right hemisphere stroke, a person relying on their left hemisphere may pay attention only to the right half of the world. And what I must emphasize is that this is not due to a failure of vision. The visual mm -hmm. system is fine. And even the auditory system, they only attend to things, over, even though wow. the auditory system is working well. So this is an attentional difference. And basically anything to the left simply doesn't exist. And it's really quite macabre. If you draw people's attention to it, they will deny it altogether. <laughs> uh, if, for example, they have a paralyzed arm on the left after right hemisphere stroke, they will claim that they can move it and exactly the same as the right. When you ask them to demonstrate it, they don't. And, and, and you sort of say, well, why are you not? They say, but I am. And say, well, none of us can see you moving it at all. If you bring it round in front of them and say, now, can you move that? They say, oh, that, that, that's not my arm. That belongs to the man in the next bed. So, wow. you know, the, the yeah. capacity for denying what doesn't fit mm. is extraordinary. So the left hemisphere makes stuff up to fit its narrative and it's convinced that it's right. Whereas the right hemisphere is always a little tentative. Even when it's right, it may think perhaps I'm not right. So in terms of, let's say, science, because um, I, I, I'm also a researcher and did my PhD in, in law on long sentence male prisoners and took a big picture approach um, that was mainly qualitative and, and actually perhaps um, for some people's tastes had too long quotations or exchanges between me and the men um, to, to kind of give context to where their words came from and a bit of the story. Um, whereas uh, science and scientific method and coding might like to take, take words out of context and maybe apply them to theories that, you know, they're quite partial to in advance rather than staying open to new new uh, explanations yeah. would that be correct ian in terms of just a, a general thing about how our brains as people um can get stuck on information that we like and that we already know well i think built into without any disrespect to the law which i admire and its practitioners but the the, the way in which it's often um practiced is somewhat abstract according to rules and so on. The best kind of law, I would say, is the tradition of common law in which you sort of go back to experience and you have judgment. This is what a judge, after all, is supposed to do, is not just follow the rules, but actually to make a judgment in context of what is going on here and how serious or otherwise it may mm. be. So um, those two aspects are presumably quite a lot at war with one another. But I would imagine that the ability to conjure the real life situation is extremely important. Um, I don't know if this is right, but in, in English law, you, you must know the figure of Lord Denning, uh, yeah. who was a justice of the Court of Appeal. And, and he has always said to have been the one who, who was able to see the rounded human picture. Uh, he had a famous yes. judgment that began, it was bluebell time in That's Kent. That's right. <laughs> he, he, he was quite in a murder case, I think. And, and environmentally <laughs> kind of vivid, for sure. Um, 
which which yes. kind of made him slightly um, not a figure of ridicule, but of mystery to judges who were more yes. maybe left brain dominant and indeed students. Yes. Um, can you tell me a little bit about uh, the movie that was made, the documentary on, on the divided brain? And one of the statements, I watched it with my husband the other night, one of the statements that kind of leapt out to me was that a lot of us in the modern world are kind of wandering around as if we have right hemisphere damage. Um, could, could you say what you, you, you mean by that and why does it matter if a lot of us have this um, tendency now? If you'll allow me, I'm just going to turn the lights up a bit because I suspect it's getting very dark here. Is yeah, that no right? problem. Yeah, go for it. Yes. Well, you ask about the film and, uh, you know, in many ways, I think it's a very, um, a, a very good job. I'm very glad that it was done. Um, but I, of course, um, I have a lot of quite subtle things to say, as you know, if you bother to mm -hmm. <laughs> ex excavate in that yes. book. Um, and the trouble with um, film is you have to keep producing sound bites, really. Sure. And so, I mean, we had very long, subtle conversations, but what inevitably gets selected tends to be uh, the more striking, quick and dirty remarks rather than the more <laughs> elaborate. <laughs> Um, so, uh, of course, we're not really like people with right, right hemisphere damage, but what I was getting at is that there are a staggering number of um, commonalities between the condition of individuals who do have um, a dysfunction in the right hemisphere and the way we as a culture look at the world. So, for example, we tend to think that for example, it's something that we are fully in control of. The left hemisphere doesn't know what it is it doesn't know, which right. is a very, very, very dangerous condition. The right hemisphere is aware of what it doesn't know. It takes in what the left hemisphere can tell it, but it doesn't work the other way. So uh, you get people who think they know it all and think that given a few more experiments, we'll be able to answer all the great problems of the universe, whereas most intelligent people realize that the more you know, the more you realize how much you don't know. Mm. Um, it tends to want to put things in black and white, cut and dried um, categories. Uh, it tends to treat individuals as though they are representatives of a certain uh, category, you know, male, female, black, mm. white, whatever demographics um, and people are so, yes and people are so much more than that um, and, and and of course that that not being understood leads to many um, many sad aspects of the life we live now but there we go um, it, it also tends towards a rather um, abstract uh, way of looking at the world which curiously is the flip side of, a, of an ultra concrete way of seeing the world. So instead of seeing um, what takes place in our consciousness and in matter as being probably seamlessly connected, it does this sort of dipole split mm. uh, in which we are living a life that is simultaneously hyper abstract and at the same time hyper concrete. Mm. Um, and, and, and this is obviously manifest in the way in which we treat the world as just a lump of resource for our exploitation. Mm -hmm. But it's also in a metaphorical way, very obvious in what I see happening, which is that metaphor and humor, which depends often on making interesting implied connections, um, is, seems to be harder for people to understand. There are more people who take things terribly literally. Yeah. because they no longer can see. They're terribly concrete in their thinking, as we would say in psychiatry. So those things happen together. And, you know, basically the vision is two-dimensional. It's on screens and so on, <laughs> as we are mm. now, rather than in the three-dimensional world in which we would interact in a, in a significantly different mm. way. Um, and we are more interested in the um, 
the, 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 the amount of something than in its quality, in quantity right. rather than quality. We're interested in surveying everything because only by making sure that we've got everything in sight that we can control it. This is the left hemisphere's thing. Mm -hmm. It needs to have control, have power, and it mm -hmm. must see everything that's going on. Um, which is why actually people who have schizophrenia, which we, we might talk about because it's in some respects rather like an isolated left hemisphere freewheeling. Okay. Um, when, when they become paranoid, you know, this is an aspect of left hemisphere overdrive. And they sometimes imagine that, that they can see things and other people can see them and are listening to them and so on. So there's this mm -hmm. um, breakdown of a trusting relationship with the world without which really as a society we're sunk. You know, if we have to legalize, legislate for, codify and turn into algorithms every aspect of our lives, we'll no longer be living. Mm. We will be as that's machines. So uh, all of these aspects are going on. And I was alerted to this by a fascinating book, um, which was pointed out to me by John Cutting, the psychiatrist I mentioned. Um, when I was in Baltimore in 1992, doing neuroimaging on the brain, in fact, on asymmetry of the brain in people with schizophrenia. And it was a book uh, called Madness and Modernism by a brilliant American psychologist called Louis Sass, who had made um, many comparisons between the phenomena described by and painted by people with schizophrenia and the phenomena of modernism, the sort right. of things we find in the art and literature and thought, and indeed reported experience of people in the modern era, that it seems to be approximating more and more to schizophrenia, which incidentally is also thought to be probably a relatively modern illness. In other words, we don't know of examples before the 18th century, whereas we do know of examples of every other known mental condition going back to the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, and so forth. So there is something interesting there, but all I'm really saying is that um, the, the things that are typical about the left hemisphere are sometimes exemplified in aspects of um, modernist perception in which things are broken up, become geometrical rather than mm. fluid and, mm. and living. And the parts. Um, that's it. Uh, and so on. The, the whole lot of these things that he, he illustrates about 25 parallels uh, between these phenomena. So if anyone's interested in looking it up, it is a good book. Thank you for that. I'm sure some people will be. And Ian, um, just in terms of psychiatric diagnosis, is, is that in and of itself the classification, you know, of symptoms and um, looking, you know, at lists of what manifestations of behavioral problems um, match whatever diagnosis? Is that essentially a left hemisphere function? And, and, and does psychiatry sufficiently engage with the whole person and the whole context and their environment, their social situation, their maybe their trauma history. Um, as a profession, is it a bit stuck in the left brain or, or does it combine aspects of both, I suppose, in its treatment maybe of people? Well, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't really say that. Um, mm. Of course, it depends very much on the practitioner because psychiatrists are people and people mm. have different takes on the world just as lawyers and other people do. Um, what we have is the, the important thing of we need sameness and difference together. We need division and union together. We need, you know, mm -hmm. a vision of life in which all is one is no more help than everything being scattered fragments. There needs to be form, shape and pattern to it. Right. So what we don't want is over rigid classification, but we don't just want every patient is a one off because we wouldn't have the slightest clue <laughs> how to approach helping. Right. So yes, we need to have diagnoses. And to be fair to, um, for example, DSM uh, and ICD, which are the um, respectively American and European um, codes of classification of mental disorders. Um, I remember the DSM-4R book that I used when I was in practice. In the introduction, it said, this book is not to be used like a cookbook. Right. In other words, you're not to say, so I've got one of these and two of those and so on. So I 
oh, I've baked a certain kind of cake. That's the diagnosis. Mm. Uh, one of the things I often had to explain in court um, to a, um, an interrogating barrister, because I did quite a lot of medical uh, defense and, and medical expert witness work, um, was that they may have looked in the book and said, but it seems like from this book that this person has that diagnosis. Right. And I said, well, I don't think they do. And, and to be fair, um, I've never found a case in which a judge didn't say, well, completely. I mean, your experience is quite mm. different from just reading this book. So if you are using it in a left hemisphere way, then it becomes very left hemisphere exercise. If mm. you're using it instead as an indication of an overall shape, a right. family resemblance rather than a, it's got one of those. This mm. is a, actually a difference between left and right hemispheres. They both need to categorize experience, yeah. but the right hemisphere does it on what Wittgenstein called a family resemblance. There's no one thing that they all have in common, but once you've seen them, you can see it in the whole. Whereas uh -huh. the left hemisphere is saying, it's got one of those, it goes in that category, but it might not be, you know. Right. I give the example of, you know, it's got a spire. Churches have spires. It's a church. Yeah. But there is actually a ridiculous um, multi-storey car park in Oxford that has a spire on it, and it's not a church. So, you know, <laughs> right. Um, right. right hemisphere can tell this is not a church, but the left hemisphere is, yes, it's a church, it's got a spire. So these are the differences. That's gas. And actually, I've had quite a lot of interest in my work from lawyers, if I may say so, um, particularly in Australia, where um, Chief Justice Allsop has um, continually referred to this distinction as important in coming to legal judgments, where instead of following, as it were, a rule book, one has to say, but in context, this looks completely different. So I, I'm sure that in your profession, there are those who are much more flexible mm. and understand context and its importance and those who don't. Yeah, fascinating, really, really fascinating. Um, Ian, are there examples of, of societies that were um, more right brain dominant or at least more in balance and, and were they successful? Well, yes. I mean, sometimes people say to me, because I describe what a left hemisphere society would look like, and they immediately recognize the one in which they now live. <laughs> right. And they said, well, what would, what would a right hemisphere society look like? And I have to say, we're very balanced because the important point is the right hemisphere knows it needs the left hemisphere. The left uh. hemisphere doesn't know it needs the right hemisphere. And um, the, the, um, the, the title of my book, The Master and His Hemisphere, is designed to reflect this. The master, the right hemisphere that sees everything, appoints an hemisphere because he realizes he actually needs somebody to go and do the admin. Mm. But the, the, this, this bright administrator, although fairly bright, is not bright enough to know what it is he doesn't know. So he thinks, well, I'm the master, really. And he doesn't bother to report back. And so things fall apart. Now, that actually is an image of the way the two hemispheres relate. So the right hemisphere is more willing to relay information to the left. It does so more and faster than the left does to the right. So um, it may sound a bit of a cop out, but we need them both. And there cannot be a society in which there is um, just the right hemisphere. Sure. Partly, of course, because we need to be able just to survive physically, to be able to get food um, and to build a hut or whatever. However, um, there have been societies when they've been much more in balance. And that was something that I thought about and investigated and formulated in my mind quite a lot over the history of ideas, which in my pre-medical life, I've very much been involved in studying. And what I found was that in Athens around the sixth century BC, and then again in Rome around the year dot, and then again in the early Renaissance in Europe, we've had um, a brilliant coming together of the left and right, the left serving the right. The emissary must serve the master, not usurp the master. Mm -hmm. And so administration is terribly important. But if administration is all there is, then you're completely lost. Yeah. And so the left hemisphere's job is important, but it mustn't become the overriding mm. 
way of thinking, which it is now mm. in pretty much all public debate of intellectuals, in the way we think about the natural world in which we think about society, uh, as a utilitarian functionist vision of material, basically. Mm. So um, in those societies, what happened was that for a while, everything flourished. People took the detailed investigation, they took the broad picture. They um, investigated um, nature, history, they took a broad perspective looking backwards and forwards. They, they, they mapped the skies, they mapped the seas, they started looking at animals and plants and bringing together what the right and the left hemisphere see there. Mm. Um, and these were hugely productive eras in which also um, moral codes like laws were, mm. were laid down. But then with time, fossilization, uh, to put it briefly and bluntly, mm. settled in. Things became more hierarchical, more purely utilitarian, serving a militaristic or, um, or, or at least a, um, a, a, an empire-based mm. um, uh, structure. Uh, in other words, they overreach themselves through their overweening desire for power, for grabbing, right. for taking. Mm. And I see that absolutely as our current predicament, which will, barring some miracle, will finish us off as a civilization. So it is very important. But every time it moves not towards the right, because, as it were, the right sees the point of the left, but always it's a ratchet towards the left. Because the further you go down that path, since the left hemisphere doesn't see what it doesn't see, it gets more and more stuck into its own belief, which is easily understandable also on a purely sort of human basis that something that makes you wealthy, makes you rich, makes you powerful, grabs you comforts, very alluring and seductive. Mm. And you begin to think that all the other things like actually, no, a little bit of moral restraint, a little bit of, you know, uh, depths in the way in which we think about what a human being is, what the world is, how we relate to the cosmos as a whole. We don't really need that anymore because mm. we've got our iPhone, which will tell us all the answers. Um, I, I, I know I've detained you a long time, but just a couple more. One on education, because I think it's so important in how, you know, we want to rear children and what we value and the curriculum is prioritizing certain types of subjects that I suspect are more left hemisphere leaning. Um, what's your view on the elevation of subjects like music, art, drama and dance that um, are more emotional and effective and embodied and um, there's, there's the in-between uh, humans and the social aspect. Do we need to elevate them in the curriculum, Ian, do you think? I think very definitely we do. And I also think that we need to rediscover the value of the humanities in general, of learning how to think philosophically, um, how to be critical of a point of view, how to propose a point of view and then turn around and criticize the mm. point of view, to so see both sides of a question. And I don't think that's the way people are educated now. Um, even if you were a principally a scientist, you wouldn't have been able to leave school until the 1960s without having had a degree of submersion in history, foreign languages, quite possibly a bit of Latin and Greek, mm. and all these things which put you in touch with other ways of thinking, other aspects of life that are human. And it's only become rather recently that people can emerge entirely technically with a technical training that is not mm. an education. An education yes. is not just giving people information, but allowing parts of them to grow that are there already. You don't, a teacher doesn't put things in, a teacher draws things out. In fact, it's in the word education, as you know. And uh, uh, this brings me to the point that it's not just what we teach, i.e. the syllabus, but it's yeah. how we teach it. Okay. So I'm not asking for a softening up I'm asking of, for greater rigor in our thinking, but at the same time, the excitement of thinking clearly, cleverly, and taking in the whole picture and seeing how things that you're learning in physics actually have connections with things you're doing in your philosophical classes mm -hmm. and how, ah, at a certain point in history, people wouldn't have seen it like this. They'd have mm -hmm. seen it. And that's not because they were stupid. That's because they saw something that we don't see. So all of this needs to be brought back in.
And of course, that includes the creative aspects of things, understanding poetry, understanding music, above all music, and dance and visual arts, as you say, I think all these, and drama, I think all these are very, very valuable. And curiously enough, although it doesn't actually work very well with people who are profoundly mentally ill, but psychotic, but for people who are not, um, actually therapies that work through those um, means can be very, very powerful. Um, as you, you, I see from your smile that you, you've discovered too. And, you know, I would say to some highly articulate um, lawyer, I want you to go and do art therapy. And he said, oh, I was never any good at that. And that can't tell me anything, you know. <laughs> and what I knew is that this person was so good at articulating things his way that he wasn't actually seeing whole aspects of himself that were very, very important. Mm. And then the next time I'd see him, I said, well, how have you been getting on? He said, that, that art therapy. Mm. I, I don't know what it was. I was just doing a, a making a picture of my, my, my partner or something. And, and then tears started rolling. And yeah, he knew wow. actually something, something had been it connected with something. that wasn't being connected with before. And he was becoming more of a whole person. And some of the reasons that people suffer are because they're cut off from parts of themselves they don't like. Mm. Um, an awful lot of perfectionism in our society. So people think they must be perfect and blameless mm. and so on. Well, and people will sometimes say, I don't feel that life is under my control. <laughs> and in a gentle way, I have to say to them, well, join the club, you know. Yeah. We're, all, we're all getting I, a sense of that these days with the pandemic. And also of our embodiment, you know, and how little yes. reason has to do with our experience. Our bodies have become so painfully, um, I suppose, brought home to us. But Ian, can I ask you one, one last one maybe about um, politics and, and public policy making, which I think tends to view complex social problems in a very, again, compartmentalized, fragmented, siloed right. type of way. Um, and um, there, there is this interesting project um, in, in the States, in Washington, D.C., that is a kind of social determinants of health approach, marrying adverse childhood experience, science, um, and trying to kind of, I suppose, eradicate um, racism and also instill social equity, which is a massive task. But if I can just read something to you to get your take on it, on page 33 of their policy and advocacy guide, they give this advice. Your hook should combine both data and stories. Most elected officials will gravitate towards a personal narrative, but their staffs, the ones who will ultimately be writing legislation, covet the data. Use the rule of no stories without data and no data without stories. One way to create a strong hook is to combine overall data about the children you serve with a story about a particular child, focus on the ways that the story reinforces what the data are telling you and vice versa. Does that suggest to you an attempt to kind of integrate the right and left hemispheres of the brain to maximize um, people's, people's chances, I suppose, of positively impacting policy, Ian? I definitely do. Um... In a way, it's like speaking parables, isn't it? Mm. it, it it's like myths, which are um, repositories of ancient wisdom that speak to us at a level that is not just the, uh, the limited way in which we can easily articulate things. What I think is interesting in that remark was the suggestion that there was a difference between the, the people who were you know, administrating and the people yeah. who might have the overall vision. And I think this is very, very true, that the problems of um, silo mentality that you describe are everywhere at the sort of um, cold face, if you like, um, or, or, or uh, uh, the, the, the machine interface with society the vast bureaucracies that have to churn out rules and procedures and so on. Whereas the people with the vision are seeing something else. And this is also true in, um, in business. So for example, um, 
I've had a certain amount to do with, with certain businesses that have asked me to advise. And what's clear is that the people at the top have a lot of imagination and they see exactly what the problem is in terms of they, they gravitate to the idea of the difference between the hemispheres. Mm. But this, this sort of runs into the sand as you have to get down into the sort of mechanizing aspect of this. I'm not sure what the, the solution is. Um, it's a little bit like the problem in science, actually. I know, I know you want to talk about administration, but there is a parallel here, which is that great scientists are very flexible thinkers and they think imaginatively and they see the forms, the shapes that resonate. And that's how they make the great discoveries. But there are all kinds of people who are, as it were, science slaves at the yeah. work benches of every day in the offices who come in at nine and go home at five. And they don't see, I find them very resistant to big ideas, whereas I find people at the top of their game are terribly responsive to them. Mm. I think you've got the same thing there, that there'll be lots of people who have a vision, but that in trying to get that into practice, you have to exercise a kind of sleight of hand to be able to <laughs> um, defeat this this tendency for everything to run into ever more arid areas of uh, uh, what I always say of course is that you can't change things by just changing the procedures by making new rules or even by instilling information into people to come back to education. Mm. You have to draw something that they're already at some level aware of out mm. of them and help it grow. And then you don't need to tell them uh, not to do this, that, or the other that they're doing at the moment that is a behavior you wish to mm. change. Because if you only change the behavior, it won't mean anything. They may stop saying things that you consider um, offensive or, 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 or you know wrong-minded in some way mm. but they, they won't really have changed at heart there'll just be a huge discrepancy between what they are saying and doing in every day and what at some level of they themselves they know to be the mm. case or think they know to be the case mm -hmm. so really you have to be changing people and this comes back to education that it's not about um, instilling information or technical skills. They, those play a part. I mean, my own education involved colossal amounts of information um, from a very early age, you know, um, because in those days, one did have to learn an awful lot of facts in learning about history and, mm. and things like that, which I'm not sure people do so much. I don't know now. Um, but it's not that in itself that's the problem. It's the lack of the vision overall mm. of, you know, why are we learning these things? Mm. Because in fact, they flesh out something else. Like, you know, you have to practice scales if you're learning the piano. But, you know, you're not doing that because learning the scales is the key thing. It's mm. just to give you an expertise mm. that will enable you to not think about scales at all. Mm. So again, we shouldn't be concentrating on the things that help you get there, but on the core essence of mm. the vision that we're dealing with and in the, the one that we want to elicit in the people we're trying to, to, to change or help. I think a bit of humility is not a bad idea as well. I think the big organizations don't instill humility. <laughs> and I think that often, often very great people I've noticed often do have considerable humility mm. because they see exactly what it is that they don't really know. Mm. Um, whereas I think there's an awful lot of people uh, busying themselves these days who think they've got all the answers and they think no, they know what is right and wrong. But I rather doubt that they do really. Before I let you go in, is, is there any aspect uh, by the way, of- I've got I've got, I've got time. I oh, mean, do I'm not you? Okay, great well, I'm, I'm just interested um, in your take on what are some of the most important public policy issues of, of our time. You mentioned our desecration kind of of the planet. Is that something that you think is an important matter that we need to try and properly address if we want to survive? Well, <laughs> if you'll pardon the expression, is the Pope a Catholic? I mean, I, <laughs> this is very, very yeah. definitely um, something that has to be the single most important issue of all, head and shoulders above anything else. Because if we can't do something very different, we won't be here to put any other policies into action mm. at all. 
Um, so we issues to do with the uh, the environment as it's called, but which I never like to call the environment because it sounds so technical and alien and suggests that it's something around you, not something that you are part of, right. that you come out of and return to. So I like to say nature, which also personifies it as a, a female figure of a divine kind, which I think right. is very good. So, um, that's got to be the number one. But then I think I'm going to say something that probably won't resonate. Well, it might do. I don't know. How, why should I presume whether it will resonate with your listeners or not? But I think that we have to be careful also to nourish a civilization. And at the moment, because of our highly technical black and white thinking, we're busy destroying civilization. If, if life becomes very, very difficult, civilization may well break down, but it will break down more catastrophically and with less chance of recovery and in a more um, unthinkably horrible way if we've sacrificed the values of a civilization which are built up slowly, painfully through battles. Literally, people gave their lives and their blood to bring about a society such as ours, which is for all that people say of it, more tolerant than any society that's ever existed. Mm -hmm. And we must be careful not to, not to lose the good qualities of that and not to be too keen to rubbish it in the interest of some alternative thing that is as yet untried and unknown. Mm -hmm. So I think the, after the not, not, not having a war on nature, I think another would be not to have a war on civilization and on our culture. Mm -hmm. There's much wrong with our civilization. Uh, I'm in the curious position that I'm a, a huge critic of Western civilization. And I've often thought that if only we were able to learn from the East before the East became more Western than the West, right. we would have had a chance of doing well. Um, so I'm a huge critic of it. I see its weaknesses, but I also see its strengths and why it is something very, very special, miraculous, really, and why people from the East come here to, to see the great things that we have produced. Um, and similarly, I feel the same way about, I mean, that's irrelevant, but I feel the same way about my more narrow culture as, uh, as somebody British or English. I, I'm enormously critical of it when I compare it with many of my European its European counterparts, um, but I also think that it's a shame to not see its good qualities. And I'm always really doing the splits and trying to say, look, hang on, guys, we need to be bringing these two things together, not sure. splitting them apart. Yeah. And it's yet the, the drift is very much towards extremism, extreme policies, n not nuanced ones. Mm. So we need to think before we instigate any further policies, how will this work in reality, not in my theory, to produce a society that is genuinely more compassionate, more mm. tolerant, and richer imaginatively, and clever and productive, um, not one in which people apologize for being excellent. You know, excellence is something that every civilization needs. Mm. Um, so we don't want that. So, you know, there are lots of interesting strands here. Um, Sorry, I'm probably not being very no, clear. No, 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 it's wonderful. Um, one other thing that I found so interesting uh, about the right hemisphere is its ability to tune into the other, you know, the, the other people. Okay. This, I think you use the phrase, I, thou, and the betweenness and um, the relationality that the left hemisphere is more me, 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 grabby, graspy and individualistic and, and driven towards success. Is it in, in terms of um, public policy, and I'm just thinking now again with, with the climate emergency or, or nature under attack and the movement of peoples um, that might arise because of this, it might that put a big strain on our already um, sometimes limited uh, compassion for the other, especially when that other is from a different place and maybe doesn't look like us. Is that a danger, mm -hmm. Ian? It is, and there are dangers 
all around us in this. I, I obviously um, don't have a an answer. <laughs> <That's> sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but but I think you are right. I mean, the right hemisphere sees the necessity that we are not as. Dunn said, no man is an island, you know, and we're not. We are um, not just that we owe things to other people, which we do, um, and that they owe things to us, which they do, but that we are who we are as individuals, not in some sort of vacuum. Our very individuality is created by the society um, which made us and to which we have loyalties or should have. Uh, in turn. So it's a network, a, a seamless network, if you like. And the point about betweenness is not, I use this, well, I invented this term really, not just to refer, although it does obviously include uh, empathy, but to include the concept of a relation in which the parties that were in the relationship or looked like they were in the relationship when it was analyzed are changed by the relationship and the power comes out of the relationship. The best example is music. Right. I mean, a, 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 an image I've used to death, but, but you know, when you take it apart, it's just notes and notes mm -hmm. are nothing. Everything is in the relations, but it's sure. not just in the relations because the relations are actually silent. And mm. <laughs> so there's no music in the silence. Mm. It's in the coming together of the silences and the music and the whole, rather like an electric current is not in the positive pole or the left, uh, the negative pole, nor in the space in between them, but in the whole thing, positive pole, left pole, and the circuitry. So it's that concept that's hard to get across because people have already analyzed things into, oh, there's this bit and that bit and the connection. But those three things are an analytic conception. Mm. Whereas overall, um, there is a single seamless whole. And in the book that I've just written, which is unfortunately three times longer than the one that you <laughs> have in your hand, <laughs> literally. Um, and I don't know don't know what's going to happen to it. But uh, one of the things I argue for is that relations are primary. Yeah. In other words, they're actually prior to the things that are related, which may sound that it makes no sense at all. How can a relationship exist before mm. there are the things that get related? But my view is, uh, and I can, you know, I'm not going to now, but in the book, I ex mm. explain that from a point of view of physics, philosophy, and neuro, neuro, neuroscience that the connections uh, is like a network. Mm. The nodes in the net are not the primary thing from which the network is put forward. The network is the strands, the relations. Mm. And it's when you see that whole that you identify something that attracts your attention, a point where there's a cross. Yes. And you say, oh, that's a node. So yeah. as it were, that is a secondary phenomenon in a seamless Whole. And in Indian cosmology, there's the concept of um, a, a, a net over the cosmos, mm -hmm. the net of Indra. And the, the, it has, it's, the net is primary, the fibers of the net are primary, but at the place where they cross, there are little jewels. And in each of the jewels, all the other jewels in the net are also reflected, which is a fantastic Beautiful. Image. Now, if you get, get policymakers to think a little bit more like that. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's my ne next task for sure. You know, I'll have to somehow uh, get my thinking cap on and figure that one out. It's a beautiful image, though. And that's what's yeah. wonderful, I think, about your work is, is, is drawing together, you know, the, 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 the sciences, the psychiatry, the um, studies on stroke patients and the philosophy, the, the linguistics. It's, it's very, very rich and fascinating. So... Uh, yeah. Dr. Ian McGilchrist, I'm so thankful that you um, shared your, your time with me and your, your fascinating insights. And I hope you do get that book out before too long. What's it, what's it called? Do you have a title yet? Well, uh, my title for it is The Matter with Things, because in a way I'm attacking the idea that there is only matter and there are only things. Okay. Uh, and that that is part of the matter with things at the moment. <laughs> Um, Very nice. But I, I don't know whether my, my publisher will, uh, I don't know whether my publisher intends to publish it at all or as mm -hmm. one book or as three books or, okay. so I don't know, but that's okay. my vision of it at the moment. Okay, well, okay. Well, it was a, a huge pleasure talking to you. And, Thanks. Um,
So this, yeah, well, we'll be in touch maybe. And uh, so everyone, thank you for tuning in. This has been Law and Justice with me, Jane Mulcahy. And it's been a great pleasure and an honor to chat to Dr. Ian McGilchrist. Thank you for your time, Ian. Thank you very much.